Hello and welcome to this session in which we will discuss authorization and authentication as a form of cybersecurity defenses. Now, to enhance our cybersecurity defenses, the organization should not only use sophisticated software and hardware, but also they should adopt operational practices that support the technology. And one of those operational practices is using is using authentication and authorization. Think of authentication. Let's assume you want to attend a museum. First thing you do is you will show your ID at the museum do door to prove your membership. If you are a member, good, great. They would allow you to come in as long as you have the proper ID. That's authentication, you're authenticated. Once you are allowed inside the museum, then the authorization will take place. It determine which area of the museum you can access based on your membership level. Yes, you are a member, you are able to access the museum, but not the whole museum. What are you authorized to see in that museum based on your membership level? And this is what we will discuss. Let's go ahead and get started. Before we proceed any further, I have a public announcement about my company, FarhatLectures.com. Farhat Accounting Lectures is a supplemental educational tool that's going to help you with your CPA exam preparation as well as your accounting courses. My CPA material is aligned with your CPA review course such as Becker, Roger, Wiley, Gleam, Miles. My accounting courses are aligned with your accounting courses broken down by chapter and topics. My resources consist of lectures, multiple choice questions, true-false questions, as well as exercises. Go ahead, start your free trial today. Authorization versus authentication. The first thing we are going to implement as part of this is something called zero trust. What is a zero trust? As the word suggests, trust no one. Zero trust is a strategic approach to cybersecurity that eliminate the traditional assumption of trust from a network infrastructure. What does that mean? It means under this policy, under the zero trust policy, no one is trusted. Everyone will have to verify themselves, verify, re-verify themselves, prove that they are authorized to do what they're supposed to do. So no entity, user, device, application, anything inside or outside the network is automatically trusted. Instead, everything must be verified before access is granted. And this verification will typically include continuous monitoring and validation. So the system constantly monitor, revalidate the security position of devices and users to ensure they meet the organization's security requirement. So they're constantly checking on you, making sure you belong there and you have the authority to belong there. They could use multi-factor authentication. What's that? Zero trust architecture often require the use of this multiple piece of evidence, factors, multi-factor to verify their identity. Well, these features can include something that they know. So yes, you have a password. Passwords are good. But with zero trust, something that they have, in addition to the what you know, the password, you have to have some sort of a security token or something that they are, like your fingerprint, biometric verification, um, your, your facial, facial recognition, something that belongs to you. Combining all of those, this is what we say multi-factor. So they're not, they're not using only one thing to verify you, multi-factor authentication. So it's not only your password, it's your password and some sort of a security token sent to your email or sent to your phone. Also, within this zero trust, you could use what's called micro segmentation. And we saw this in networking where we segment the network. This involved dividing the network into smaller secured zone. So if you want to go from one zone to the other, you have to re-verify yourself. Access, access to these zones requires separate authentication, significantly reducing the potential impact of a breach. So that's one thing you can do with authorization. You want to make sure everyone that's there, verified, authorized, good to go. Another method you could use is something called the least privilege. The principle of re least privilege is about limiting users' access right to only what's strictly required to complete their tasks. So give them access to actually what they need to do in order to complete their task. It's a fundamental security strategy that reduces the attack service, the attack footprint. You're giving the users less access. Why? Because you're only giving them access to exactly what they need to do, not open access. It limits the potential for privilege escalation because if you have access to other areas, you might be able to do something else with that, this access. 
So implementing the least pri privilege involved regular audit of the user's right and permission on a regular basis review who access who has access to what and adjusting those permissions as necessary you may not you're not supposed to be there we're going to take you out and this helps ensure that users don't accumulate privileges over time that they long that they no longer need you no longer need this privilege we're going to take it out also we would implement something called RBAC the role based access control assigning permission to roles rather than individuals this simplifies the management of user privilege. So simply put, do you have access to that role? If yes, then we'll give you the access. Users then assign roles that correspond to their job function. So this is least privilege. Giving you the least amount of surface just to do your job. Need to know principle, similar but different, and we're gonna show the difference later on. The need to know principle, take the concept of the concept of least privilege and apply it to information so need to know applies to information access it's about ensuring that sensitive information is only accessible to individual who needs it whose role requires them to have that information to do their job i'm going to give you access to the system that you need and only to the information need to know principle only the information that you need to do your job Implementing this principle involves data classification. Here what I do is I look at my data and I classify it. I'm going to give you access to certain information. Here the organization must first identify and classify their data based on the sensitivity. You know, highly secretive, sensitive, highly sensitive. And based on your job, I'll give you access to the, to the, to the level of the data that you need and the relevance to different roles within the organization. Also, we'll have access control policies, policies that define what level of data are accessible to various roles within the organization. So you know what data you have access to. And these policies help in enforcing the need to know principle. Again, need to know and least privilege, they're not the same. Need to know applies to the information, apply to the information that you have access to. And again, at the end, I'll just kind of work a quick example explaining the two. Whitelisting. What is whitelisting? It's a proactive defensive mechanism that allow only specified software, email addresses, users, and other entities to have access, right, or perform operations. Simply put, you clear everyone up front, whether it's email, user, software, applications. If it's not whitelisted, you cannot use it. Unlike blacklisting, which blocks known threat, whitelisting only permits known safe entities. Those could be users, software, email addresses. Key aspect of this include application whitelisting. Only approved applications are allowed to run. This will reduce the risk of malware infection. Only we would ha will ha also have controlled access to resources. By controlling which device and users can access certain network resources, we can prevent unauthorized access and potential breaches. So whitelisting is another way to do what? To make sure uh, we are solving the problem right at the origin not allowing any user um, email access um, other entities other software uh, access to our system so what's the difference between least privilege and need to know I, I know we discussed them but let's many students have you know some difficulty understanding the difference least privilege remember limit users access right and permission to only what they need to perform their job function i'm giving you access to resources that you need. Focus on restrict, restricting ac action and access to system or environment. For example, we have a developer that's, that's granted access to the development environment and version control system necessary for coding, but not to the production environment. So I'm giving you access to one area, but not the production environment. I'm not giving you the privilege to the production environment, which exceeds your job requirement. Need to know this principle restricts individual access to information, ensuring that they only have access to data necessary for their job function. It's about safeguarding sensitive information by controlling who gets to know what. No information. What information? If we go back to that developer, the developer might have access to technical documentation for the development purposes, but not to confidential business information like marketing strategies or financial projection, which are irrelevant to the role. Um, I am giving you information based on need to know for your job. And that information is technical documentation, not marketing strategy. In essence, 
if you want to summarize it, least privilege is what the users can do. Action and system access, what can they do? Need to know is about what the user can know. Need to know is information access. Both are critical for minimizing risk for unauthorized access and data exposure. Let's take a look at this multiple choice question from farhatlectures.com. A financial services company is implementing a zero trust security model to enhance its cybersecurity position. Which of the following action is most aligned with the principle of zero trust? Be careful when we say the most, the highest, because you could have more than correct, you can be all four logical correct answers, but not the most aligned with what you're looking at. So we're looking at zero trust. Let's read the option. Installing antivirus software on all employee devices, allowing employee to use any application they prefer for work-related tasks, requiring multi-factor authentication for accessing, accessing for company's internal system, granting all employees access to the company's financial record to foster transparency. So which one of those is aligned mostly with zero trust? Zero trust. Well, let's take a look. Installing antivirus software on all employee devices. Is this a good practice? Yes, it's a good practice. It's going to protect us from viruses. Does it, does it have to do anything with zero trust? Identifying, uh, uh, authorizing, ident authorizing and authenticating the employees. No, it's a good practice, but it has nothing to do with zero trust. I can eliminate A because it's irrelevant to the zero trust policy. Allowing employee to use any application they prefer for work-related tasks, that's not good. Uh, that, that's not a good practice altogether. Not good for zero trust, not good for anything. You don't want to allow them any application. This should be an easy peasy elimination. B is out. Requiring multi-factor authentication for accessing the company's internal system. Uh, is this part, is this could be part of zero trust? Yes. Multi-factor authentication means what? It means they have to input their password. This is what they know. And then they have to have access to something that they have, like their cell phone, uh, maybe a token that's going to give them some sort of a code to add, like code 175682. And this code will change every 30 seconds. And they'll have to input this code again with their password. In other words, even though they know, they know the password, they still have to have this code, this token. It could be like a token in their hands, a token on, as an app on their system. Maybe the company sends them a text message to their cell phone that's into already registered. So this is a multi-factor authentication that is in compliance with zero trust, but let's see if D is a better answer. Granting all employees access to the company financial record to foster transparency. No, we don't want to do that. That's not how you foster transparency. Employees should have access to the need to know basis. So C correct is the correct answer as we expected. What should you do now? You want to go to Farhat Lectures, look at additional MCQs that's going to help you prepare for the CPA exam for your accounting courses, uh, whether you are studying for some sort of a professional certification, invest in yourself. Good luck, study hard, and of course, stay safe.